Um, my name is Mark Sivok. I'm going to be moderating this panel with a couple of my speakers up here who will introduce themselves um, right after I'm done talking. Uh, we're going to be talking about kind of the role of technology in design and how sometimes it seems to eclipse design and how sometimes it seems to inform design and just its overall relationship, um, which is good because we've already had things like 3D printing pop up a bunch of times today. And so hopefully we'll be able to speak a little bit more about that. Um, so to give you a little bit of background about myself, I am a triple Husky, meaning that I have all three degrees from Northeastern. Um, yeah, <laughs> maybe I'll do an MBA and go for a quad, I don't know, we'll see. Um, I have a PhD in engineering and uh, I'm joint faculty between the College of Arts, Media and Design and the College of Engineering. And I'm also the managing director of the 3D printing studio here in the library, um, which is a really exciting resource that we put in for our students um, two years ago and has now is really coming up to full capacity with what we can do uh, to, to help support what we're trying to do here at the university. Um, so I've done, I've been involved with these kinds of technologies and seen how they've shaped my work since uh, I started with my graduate work in 2007. And uh, I've done everything from using 3D printers and 3D scanners in uh, medical devices. Some of the first work I did was with 3D scanning people's legs to create um, ankle leaf orthotic devices that better fit them. And then I also did some work in um, creating devices that could be used in an MRI machines so that we had to have them be plastic. So we used 3D printers to do that. Um, all the way up to some of my work now, which is looking at um, how we can use 3D printing in education and how we can um, how we can expand the use of it and get it, make sure it's used correctly. Um, so two of my other speakers here, I'm just gonna have them introduce themselves and talk um, a little bit about the work that they've done and kind of how they see uh, the role of technology and design. And then uh, I have some questions, but the format of this panel, um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask at any time. And hopefully we will let the topic drift um, for the interests of the audience. Hi, um, my name is Janos Stone. I'm um, <laughs> going to have two microphones in a second. I'm a, a sculptor. I have two degrees in sculpture, um, which are 10 years apart, which was kind of cool because that actually meant I got to try my hand at sculpture for a long time and see if it actually was something I wanted to do again. Um, work in very traditional media, but then also I'm a new media artist, which means I also work in digital um, media in my work, which is an interesting kind of hybrid of the two. And it was that hybridization that led me to um, developing um, web and mobile tools that um, ideally will help everybody um, sort of design and create objects for themselves in a very kind of um, easy yet robust way. Um, we'll probably talk more about that. Here at Northeastern, I'm the design researcher in residence, and a lot of what I do is create interdisciplinary projects, um, build small teams around those projects to research um, uh, uh, sort of a wide area of ideas. They always have an art and design foundation, but I've worked on projects with the law school, the business school, sciences, um, most of the colleges at this point to investigate where art and design can integrate into um, those um, different disciplines so that we can look for um, new undiscovered areas of value and also um, new products, new, new ideas. And so it's very much a kind of um, nascent exploratory group that I'll direct and um, it's been absolutely fantastic. Hey, I'm Ryan Bardsley. Um, I studied industrial design at RISD, uh, where I met Janos. And um, I got hired out of school to work at Mitsubishi Electric Research Lab, um, working on some really early virtual reality work. I was doing a lot of 3D graphics uh, at RISD and ended up working with a group that started really the first medical simulation research effort at Mitsubishi Electric. Japanese economy tank, they sold our research project. Anyways, we moved <laughs> across the street to, uh, to Mass General where I worked for 13 years doing 
humanoid robotics, mostly for the army. So a ton of 3D printing, molding, hardware, software, systems design, educational design, working with the army to figure out what was, they were asking for technology. And what we really ended up doing is rethinking how they provided medical education. Uh, I did that for a very long time. Um, it was time for a change. And now I work at uh, the medicines company, um, which is down in New Jersey, doing pathway design, um, helping with the education team, uh, doing, we have medical devices, we have biologics, we have drugs of all sorts, and I help sort of, you guys know, it's a, it's a very, it's a complex world, right? This, this whole idea of medicine, and there's no point at which you're done. There's the reimbursement side, there's the usability side, there's the manufacturing side, there's the education side. It's just, that's what I love. I love that complexity, and that's where I think being a designer really fits into that that world. So, so uh, one of the one of the first things I want to talk about. If anybody has seen some of the articles recently about the first three D printed car, um, it was built in forty four hours, which is really impressive. Until you remember that off of the Ford assembly line, they're making cars about every three minutes. And so there's kind of this misconception about um, how rapid 3D printing truly is and how its usage um, can really be best applied. Uh, we had some great examples from some of the previous speakers about using 3D printing or rapid prototyping or additive manufacturing, whatever word you'd like to use for it. Um, but there are plenty of ways to use it incorrectly. Um, and one of the things that uh, we see a lot is with the, a family of technologies, 3D printing I think is just the most popular right now, is that they are um, breaking down barriers where previously stuff that was very, very difficult to do has now become really easy. So, so 3D scanning and motion capture are two other examples of this. And so one of the things I wanted to ask uh, my two panelists up here is what do you think the impact of technologies that break down that are enabling and collaborative and um, inclusive, what does it mean for how we do design? All right, <laughs> here we go. Um, <laughs> so I think, I mean, you know, the three of us up here were on the ground designers. So I'm going to sort of look at that group of people, I think, when I answer this. And um, I worked on a project for a while where we talked spoke with um, product designers and um, sometimes who worked in large companies and sometimes who worked out of small, for example, Brooklyn studios and spoke to them about this notion that with easy to use 3D scanning, and by the way, 3D scanning is the ability to take a handheld device, move it around an object and in real time capture a 3D file from that object. And this technology it will be in your phone after Christmas, if you like, and is getting very cheap and very easy to use. So the potential, um, you can see the lawyers kind of going, hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's some interesting potential there. Um, anyway, so what does it mean when the rest of us can create these objects using scanning and printing? And how do these designers design products that um, can kind of meet those needs. And a lot of what we spoke about, and Mark was, was part of this, a lot of these conversations as well, was that some of the new products coming out may serve multiple functions. And the example we used, we used a lot was, I'm a ceramicist and I make one bowl at a time. I throw the bowl on the wheel, I fire it, glaze it, fire it, sell it. With this technology, I can do that process. Then I can 3D scan the bowl. I can 3D print it in ceramic. There's actually a 3D printing ceramic company that was founded here in Boston. It does a very nice job of it. And I can now sell that bowl infinite amounts of times. Same product. So my little Brooklyn studio, I can now sell something. Not, so it kind of goes out in this, you know, on this plane as, as this sort of unlimited amount of sales to this one designer. I can also take that bowl and by changing material and scale, 
I can make it into a plastic salad bowl. I can also reduce it down, print it in silver, and make a bead out of it. So now I'm able to take the single product, sell it a zillion times this way, but then also create multiple layers from which I can also sell it a zillion times. So now I'm a factory that makes, I made one product, I can potentially make many, many things from it. So this is a massive design challenge for designers. How do you make a single thing that functions on all of these different ways? Because I think you need to start thinking about this as a designer, because if you don't do it, someone with this iPhone app may scan your thing and print it, make it a little smaller, print it in silver, that probably gets away from IP restrictions, and sell it. So I think designers have to start thinking in a, in a kind of a more three-dimensional, if you will, kind of a, a mentality. One thought. <laughs> um, I, I would say from trying to relate something to 3D printing that, you know, I was trained to use a lathe, a mill, like the classic metalworking tools you would typically use to make objects, right? Uh, engineered objects. Anything freeform was somewhat sculpted and then cast and then tried to be turned, you know, put a boss in there so you could drill a hole and mount it to the rest of those more blocky things that you would make on a mill. 3D printing definitely gets around that, but it's just another tool. It's, um, and I feel like that's where design is still going to play a role in that, you know, in, in kind of in the example, trying to use what Janos just said, um, when you start getting small, the problems with that manufacturing technology rear their heads. You, know, you, you really start to see like, eesh, you see the resolution. I'm working on a, a surgical robot that I'm building on my really crappy 3D printer, which is actually a pretty good one. <laughs> and like it's two millimeters wide and it's four millimeters long and it barely prints. It's just every single problem that comes out in that printer comes out. But I'm, I'm a designer, so what am I, I'm, my job is to figure out, given these tools, is there a better one out there? Do I need to rethink, should I print the mold that's larger? Should I use precision blanks that I, I know are the right size and just make a holder for them and then cast around them? It's, it's just another way, it's just another tool that, you know, when you, when you start trying to scale things up, you realize the word rapid, it's not really that fast. It actually takes quite a long time to print these stupid things out. Um, but I feel like the, the, the challenge as, as a designer looking at that accessibility is anybody can buy it. Anybody can go out and buy one of those maker bots or the, I have a form one that SLA prints brittle resin, but it's like pretty decent quality. Anybody can buy it, it's two, $2,000 or something like that. But then what? You know, like I have 20 years of experience working with these stupid things and I can barely get it to work. It's just, <laughs> so, so I think that there is still going to be a role of how do you design around the limitations of these devices? Kind of like you were talking about with, um, you know, going, getting as close as you can to the final manufacturing process. You know, we've done we've done a lot of the same. We try and print. We make kind of in in the, the beautiful loop. We actually do human casts, so we get the skin texture. We then three D scan that to get the object into the the computer, knowing that the resolution is going to be nowhere high enough to be able to see those skin details. But now we've got a physical model and a virtual model that we can figure out how to get them to go back together. And then all the crap that happens in between, we don't really care about. We just fill it in with plastic or silicone and nobody sees, right? So we have an engineered part inside of a very realistic cast. Yes. I don't know, five or 10 years when they do become better and I as this non-techie person can use it, what then is the role of the designer? You know, 10 years from now, then what? Yeah, I think that that's definitely a really interesting question because I actually have a stat on this stuff that I, I found in preparation for this. 
And that was that um, by 2017, nearly 20% of durable goods will use 3D printing to create personalized product offerings. And that um, is kind of a very interesting stat to think about. So, you know, two in 10 things that you buy may be personalized to you. Like um, looking at something um, like even as simple as now there are backpack companies like Timbuktu and other ones that they will personalize the colors and materials of the backpacks you buy. And that requires not only a very different kind of precision and understanding of your audience, but it also now requires the secondary piece that Lee was really getting at, which is the experience of buying things is going to change. And it's going to change because of these technologies. So the role of the designer is different. And um, how that impacts things like how trends are set and taste is something that I'm not qualified to speak on. Um, but I do think that that is a big impact. However, right now, with 30 minutes, I can teach somebody how to use a 3D printer. I can teach you how to build something. But the power of these technologies is not in building something. It's in building the right thing. And that still can take hours, weeks, months of design to, to occur. That 3D printed car that I mentioned earlier, in the article I was reading, it said it took like 18 months to design. You know, so 18 months to design and then 44 hours to build. How does that compare to our current offerings for automotive manufacturing? I'm not, I'm not sure. But a lot of these technologies, especially the ones that have become very popular, like, you know, there's a MakerBot store on Newbury Street. Um, they are still running the risk of, of being a gimmick. And so people need to understand and designers need to understand how the best uses can occur. I mean, owning one of those machines will let you design, but it won't make you a designer. You know, I mean, it's, it's and going back to this sort of near future that I see, I, I can also imagine um, simple ways to personalize products, you know, choose the color, and size of your toothbrush and it's printed and sent to you. I mean, things like that can certainly be done now. It's not cost effective, but you can do it. And potentially that is something that's coming down the road, but um, doing that to your toothbrush does not make you a designer, right? So the analogy that we spoke about before this talk was, well, there's many, but sort of YouTube where when cameras and video cameras got into your phones, everybody can now make a movie, doesn't make you a filmmaker, and you end up with bazillions of not so great videos, but you do get on occasion some gems. I was just gonna say, being able to use a Xerox machine doesn't make you a writer, so it's <laughs> No, no, I mean, there's a million examples like that, right? Um, and this, this can kind of lead into uh, a point I really wanted to, to have these guys address, which was, um, you know, just because you know how to cook, that doesn't make you a chef, that just makes you a cook. But does, do these technologies, because of their inclusiveness, because they break down so many barriers, do we run the risk of having people use them that are wearing the wrong hat? You know, do we have people who just think, oh, well, this, this will be good enough, we can cut corners, we can design it this way, but so we don't actually need somebody who's an expert in this. Like, do, do we, are we setting ourselves up to have uh, the potential for people just using the technology because it's easy, not because um, they're the right person to, to use it. Can I jump in on that? Because I think there's a distinction here about design. I would like to design my life and I would like to let other people design their lives. That doesn't mean they have to be as good as you are at graphic design, communication, and service design. So designers who help human beings design their lives, I'm all over that. And I think that is a step beyond just customizing the color of my cufflinks. So, and it certainly applies to apps and apps across devices and all of this stuff that's now siloed because of the history of application design and development where apps don't talk to one another and blah, blah, blah. So, I, I don't need to be a great chef. I can appreciate the food I enjoy. I can design the food I can eat without being the chef. So it, it gets a little elitist and I get a little bit worried when some of the terminology comes up to say, that's not design. No, it isn't design, it doesn't have to be. But if I am making my choices, and if I am, as Nathan said so beautifully this morning, 
enabled in more choices by the active designers, then I think that's where, where we want to go. I agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we, we want, though, I mean, I think the concern that I have as a designer is that we start to see people, and it is empowerment to give people these choices and it's fantastic and I'm totally behind it. A lot of the projects I do try to help people m be able to make more choices, particularly in the things that they make for themselves. I get worried though that there could be a, a little bit of a, you know, a, um, dilution of what it means to be a practiced you know, educated designer, someone who you want to bring in to solve a very specific problem. And you start to see people studying less and less and being elevated into positions where maybe they might not be in, you know, in the past because of a lot of these tools. So. on our supermarkets that we couldn't buy that weren't even there 15 years ago. But then you look at the rise of celebrity chefs or these like super authors, these like experts in their field, they're actually much more powerful now. You know, the Il Bouli guy, you know, they're, they're much more powerful. They have much more um, authority now because of our collective intelligence quotient being much more sophisticated than they did before. So I almost think what it puts you guys in a totally new position to have much more, uh, 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 a much more robust conversation with people who actually know what the hell you're talking about than, than you could have in the past. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the really interesting things is that um, you know, people used to much more often with the things that they buy and interact with, they would make compromises like the, the chair is a great example of the, the picture you, you had where, you know, the person made a compromise, even though they got this really nice chair, they probably, maybe they chose it. Maybe they, maybe that was just the one that was there when their cubicle was set up and then they customized it to their specific needs more and more. I think we're going to see people in all aspects. And I think what many of the speakers here have, have alluded to that is because we have more enlightened design sense as customers, we need to have an even larger enlightened design sense as the, the designers, because we now, people now know what they don't like. They now know very quickly if something's bad. And the, the brand example, people jumping ship, it, it, I think is a great example because we see that um, we have to be able to react to the understanding that people want choice now and they know what they like. And these technologies and more technologies that will be coming out, more materials, better. Right now, in the, the classic sense, 3D printing has always been used as part of the process. Now, uh, Jenna had a great example where it's the end product. Those fish are the end product. They're not then cast into something else, which is the end product. They are the end product. And we may be seeing much more of that coming up. And so this, this whole idea has really changed and kind of elevated design, which is why I think a conference like this is so important. Because that's really what we see is that um, it's kind of a chain reaction. It's a conversation of elevation going up. It's almost like an arms race, but it's one where everybody wins. <laughs> you know, there's, there's one story that I think um, kind of illustrates what, what we're really talking about. It, it's when I first joined the lab at Harvard, we, it was a bunch of mechanical engineers, you know, funded by the military, great electrical engineers, software nerds, doctors. Like we had, we had a great team that had consistently produced really cutting edge novel solutions for this field we were building called medical simulation. Every single one stayed in our lab. Like everybody loved it. We like army was great. This is great stuff. Like we can't wait. We could not get things out of the lab because to make number two, every single time we'd pull that budget together, it was $450,000, $700,000. It just didn't work. The first project that I got to run 
as a designer, I said, hey, guys, the end game is not about the novel technology. It's about actually improving patient care. So from day one, the rule was no manufacturing of anything in any stage within the prototype unless you can reproduce it again. Seven years later, seven years, which took, my God, my, <laughs> that was my baby. But when we went up and approached a medical, uh, sorry, a flight simulator company in Canada who was looking to get into the healthcare market, the first thing they said when we sat down and talking about like acquisition of this technology, they're like, so can we, can, can we get three? And we actually could say, yes, here are the 3D files, here are the molds, the master molds we made. You should be able to get five parts from those molds. Here's what it's gonna cost to rapid prototype all the bits and pieces and electronics that are gonna go into making it. And it was the first project that actually made it out of our lab. It, it became a product. And that was not, that, that only came from seeing what it took to do the manufacturing the first time by hand. Like every single thing was made by hand. It, it wasn't, um, it took more time. It, it cost way more money to do it that way initially. But that was a design decision that we made to say, no, the, the end game is really what we're, what we're going after. And the only way we're gonna improve patient care is if we spend this time with what everybody, they cursed me for a very long time until we actually <laughs> had that meeting, so. So I guess, um, so in my opinion, I think that the, the 3D printing, which I think we're using today as a code word for rapid prototyping in general, um, is something that will eventually affect the manufacturing sector way more than the design sector. I, I pretty much agree with sort of the idea of the rise of the designer as an expert or a designer as sort of meta designer. Um, but do you guys have any thoughts or feelings on what's gonna happen to the people that you go to now to actually produce your objects when that those things become possibly more automated and distributed? Yeah, I mean, as, uh, as I mentioned before, and I think several of our other speakers showed as well, there's really, there's two ways these technologies have been used because, because of their speed and relatively low cost for a couple, um, they really speed up iteration, which is, if anybody's noticed, it's been a constant theme throughout everybody's talk all day today, is that iteration can lead to better design. Um, if you can figure out what you need, test it, figure out if it still works, throw out concepts, that's better. And so since these technologies allow that, there's that integral part and that's kind of what they've been known for the most. Then there's this end point now where we're really starting to see more. I don't have the stat on me, but it's something like 50% of all 3D printed parts will be final parts coming up by say like 2020. I think it's something around that. That really is also going to be a huge shift for what you're talking about, which is the endpoint manufacturing. You know, things like just-in-time warehousing and all the stuff that say like Amazon has done and many other companies have done, that and the kind of the separated nature of a, there's a company called 3D Hubs and they have a website where you can rent out your, uh, 3D printer, kind of like an Airbnb deal where people ship you jobs and you put them in boxes and ship them back out and you get a cut and it helps to subsidize the cost of your 3D printer. And so I think that how we get things made using these technologies will definitely be impacted. But I think it also goes back to now the biggest advantage of these technologies and why we use them is that we can customize the stuff that comes out. You can have all these different fish. You can make these molds and change them really quickly. That is a very powerful piece that has not been part of, of manufacturing for a long time since the assembly line was just, we're gonna plop out 10,000 of these. That's where the break even is. And now with scale, we don't see any cost savings. And so why bother with scale? Why not go for a market of one, a product of one? And I think that is really going to change uh, the, the endpoint manufacturing. Yeah. and. Um, also going back to the, the benefit to the designer, because I think they're affected very much in this as well. If as simple to use apps and software come out that allow us to personalize our products and um, the designer really needs to be involved in the, in the development of these because they are 
going to be able to imbue into them a lot of what it is that they have experienced and what they've learned over the years. And, you know, as a way of, of trying to help ensure that, that the, the, the products that come out retain a quality and usefulness and so forth. But there's a second piece to it, which is that, and something I've become really interested in, is that because it's been sort of digitized and put into apps and so forth, you're able to then track how people design, how they use these tools. So you're able to then start to see basically a creative metric. You're able to start to see how people are creative, what, they, what choices they make um, over a global um, marketplace. And that goes back to that single designer in Brooklyn to see how her bowl is being used and, and changed and so on for better or for worse, right? Because they may see that the majority of people like it in blue and she's not that thrilled with blue. So does she go with blue now or not? So I think that these tools are gonna start to really give a lot of information back to the creators as well, which will then inform the designs and we have yet to see kind of how that will affect them on the ground. Yeah, I mean, as far as manufacturing goes, I'd say we, we have a ways to go before rapid prototyping is going to really impact that. I, I mean, I think it, rapid, rapid prototyping really still is about that big. You know, it, it, the quality goes way down when you try and do something larger. It, it doesn't exist if you're trying to do something really small. There's some new biocompatible materials, but you're still <laughs> talking about implanting a, an object about that big. I mean, it's not... I, th I think it really does get back to that word iteration. You know, the, it, it lets you pr hold something in your hand very quickly that you, you still, that is manufacturing. You are still manufacturing an object. And it's kind of nice to be able to have something tangible like that. Um, but now we're like, it, it really just makes that more accessible for anybody to hold something in their hand. I think that it's sort of, it's that old design idea of like one plus one equals three, right? There are a lot of things out there, but the d design really happens in what you leave out. It's that space in between where that's not going anywhere. That's, there's still like, now that you've got all this stuff, you know, and even then keeping up with rapid prototyping trends, it's a big process, right? So it, <laughs> It's not just about making the object. It's about what what are you actually solving? What who's your user? Like what what did they do before? How do you manage change now that your new your new idea is in their hands? How do you how do you communicate with that object now that it's in your ha their hands and you can't talk about it anymore? Like that's that's design. That's not that's not going anywhere. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, I think um, um, one of the really interesting things that I've seen in working here in the 3D printing studio because it's open to all students. Anybody can come in. It's not set for one, you know, one college or another, one program or another. We have everybody. We have pharmacists come in and laser cut things. We have um, physical therapists come in and 3D print anatomy dummies. We have all kinds of stuff. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is we have people come in and their jaw drops because they think it's so cool because it is. But then the next step, the leap to making it actually useful for them can sometimes be a very gray area. And I spend a lot of my time consulting on designs for what's being made in there, talking to people about some of the little do's and don'ts. Because we still have people that think because it's so easy, they can 3D print like a screw. That's a bad idea. It's not gonna have the correct tolerances. Or I had a, a set of students last year who wanted to 3D print the axles for a bunch of toy cars they were building. They were building a, a solar car kit. It's a bad idea. There are off the shelf solutions for this. And many of the industry folks are, they've run, you've run into the same thing where 3D printing um, can sometimes seem like a band-aid for a lot of things. And I think in manufacturing, we may hit that, we may hit that bump as well where everybody just turns and says, oh, well, we'll 3D print this. The vast majority of 3D printing still isn't food safe. 
So you know, when you see designs on an, a website like Thingiverse that has 100,000 designs, and you see a bunch of coffee mugs, I don't suggest drinking a lot of coffee out of them for a sustained period of time. Um, so there's still a lot to learn about uh, how these will be used as end products that is coming, but there's, there's bumps along the way where if it's taken, if these technologies are taken as a piece out of this overall design process and they're not an integral part used along the way or used at the end to create the final uh, customized object where there are gaps that are gonna have to be filled in by somebody. It's either you know by a consultancy or, or an agent of some kind coming in to make sure that that goes smoothly. Um, because without it, you, they're, they're used incorrectly and they're not used to their full potential. Because I think that even with these issues, everybody's still really excited about these technologies because they offer something that wasn't available previously. And so harnessing that is now becoming the next big thing. How do you use these right? Not how to get them in your office. Every office has them, every school has them, but how to use them correctly. I agree with that. The, the, the gaps that you mentioned, I mean, are gonna be huge. I sort of often, people ask like, well, oh, when will I have one in my house? And like, well, you can have one in your house now if you wanna print reasonably resolution plastic parts. I don't know how many of those you need at home um, because you're gonna have to hold your breath for a long time to get something that does what you want. I mean, the 2D printer needs to do two things. It needs to make black and white and color. The 3D printer at home, in order to satisfy what you want, needs to print wood, metal, leather, plastic, ceramic, paper, concrete, potentially, a lot of different metals, by the way, in one machine. I don't see that coming anytime too soon. We're basically talking Star Trek replicator, which I want. But in the meantime, I think it's gonna be a little while. Um, so, yeah, a lot of holes. to its mission, but in theory, it's a place where you can sort of, you know, get some advice, design some stuff, send, send out your things, and then have what amounts to a small factory with a bunch of different machines um, build your thing and send it back to you. Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, analogy that's often used for this kind of model is the same thing that people did for a long time before there was digital photography, where you would take your pictures, then you would drop them off at a place that did, did your photography. They would turn your negatives into actual pictures according to your specifications, um, and they would give them to you. And so the idea with these service bureaus is kind of the same thing, where you would take whatever your design is, you would give them specifications, and they would ship it to you, you would pick it up however you're gonna use it. Um, I think that this is a model that, that's how I see us using this technology in its current form, and all these technologies, like the, the, fa um, the printing directly on fabric that you were talking about as well, I don't think people are going to own a closed printer in their garage. It's just not, um, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah, yeah, so I think, um, you know, if I was gonna have any one of these machines in my house, it'd probably be a laser cutter because then I could buy plastic and buy wood and laser cut things. Um, yeah. Uh, Um, so I think the model of having these centralized hubs that will, that can act as small run factories for things that we need, again, goes back and, and, um, works well with the, the theory that I've brought up that we will have more customized products. And so I think that that strengthens that argument. Will we one day all own 3d printers in our house? Possibly. But I know at least for me, and I work with them all the time, in order for me to really want to wring every last use out of it, the experience of using it must, must be a lot easier. Right now it could take me, and I do this all the time, anywhere from days to weeks to get the part that I want built. That's not exactly rapid. It could be rapid if I compare that process to how it used to be where it would take me two weeks to design it and then I would ship it off to a machine shop who would take six weeks to turn it around. But for my day-to-day -day life, I'd rather just walk down to True Value and get a light switch cover than print my own. And until that kind of idea changes, I think that the, the best use of it is going to be in these, uh, almost in the just-in-time model where you have a design, you'll push it out, and then it'll go from a hub to the place it needs to go.
uh, push this in two, two other directions from these uh, artifacts, parts, speaking of, in different materials. Uh, what about embedded electronics and robotics? So where do you see this going when you start adding those to the, uh, to the recipe? So one of the other technologies that I know um, Ryan has spent some time working with is now kind of along the same lines of these enabling technologies are things like uh, the Arduino platform. If anybody's heard of that, it's a very low cost microprocessor that is kind of in conjunction with technologies like 3D printing has fueled this idea of like an internet of things where you can have these very low cost microcontrollers and you can hook up sensors to them and you can make stuff talk to stuff. Um, so I think embedded electronics and the idea that sensors will be everywhere and data will be everywhere works well with a lot of the trends that we're seeing all over the place. How we see embedded electronics with 3D printing is there's everything now from a pen where you can draw a circuit on a, on a piece of paper and then you know take some simple glue and glue down the components to prototype a circuit really quickly. Is that any better than an old school breadboard? I'm not sure. But there's also the ability now um, to make short run circuits. So we're, there, it used to be that you would have these huge factories and they would plop out a couple hundred circuit boards. Now there are services where you can design a circuit board or embedded electronics and have them create three or five of them because the design software is, what is good enough that they can put whatever they want into one sheet, 10 people's different designs, and then print them all and then cut them all out, which is what they really do. Um, I think we will see more smarter devices popping up because of, again, it goes back to people are now more okay with the idea of having more data, you know, wearing a, wearing an accelerometer to tell how many steps you go, people are okay with that. Um, understanding all the information around you and having these devices that you can learn from, I think is going to be a, a great thing coming up. Yeah, I mean, uh, robotics is such a, it's very close to a lot of the stuff that I do personally. So I really like robotics. Um, it's the, the human element in robotics is really where we're at now. It's how do, how do we make robotics that fit well with our lives? And that again, goes back to a larger experience problem where, you know, we've had robots that come in and do all kinds of things, but how do we get them to be as useful as possible? And again, because of the, the ability to customize what we're looking at with a lot of these manufacturing possibilities that would allow people foreseeably to be able to customize their own, um, customize the robotic components they need for whatever task they're looking for. Um, and there are some technologies out there now that look at being able to embed uh, components inside of 3D printing while it's being built because you can just pause it being built. That's actually partially what they did with that car. Um, and that would allow us, again, a streamlining of the manufacturing of these so that we get away from the idea that you have to fit under the bell curve and be in that five to 95%, one size fits most idea and design more for a single person. I like, I like thinking of you know, both the Arduino platform um, or microcontroller in general and 3D printing. Um, just the way we ended up using it was really in that sort of the we don't really know space where you know we were doing a humanoid robot. It was a scan of an 18 year old soldier. And we were trying, we were pretending that we were gonna outsmart nature by replicating the same systems in the same space. The second you start doing that, you're like, we're pretty well designed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of extra space in there. Um, and so what we ended up doing was using the 3D printing and the 3D scanning and microcontrollers to basically say, yes, there's some type of shape over here. We don't really know what it is. You could get an MRI. We had MRIs, we had CT data, we had the ability to make that into a solid object. And then the fun part came in printing it out and then seeing what we had just to visualize it. And like, we all, we had the data in front of us. We had the slices. You could look at any single slice along the human body and go, yep, pancreas, dead space in the lung we could probably use. But like, 
how far apart really were they? Could you put a wire in between? And and that's where it really became a nice fluid process as a, as a designer was to say, well, this, this object is right here and we think we could probably put a battery pack there, but it's always gonna be upside down. So maybe the access panel should be on the front. And okay, we, we solved that lower down in the trunk in, in, in our 3D model, let's just make a cutting plane. And so everything below that is going to be the stuff that we're done with. And everything above that, we're going to start switching to custom electronics, you know, and, and putting our money in everything above this cutting plane. You wouldn't do that in classic manufacturing. You, you, you have to think about every object as a whole. With, with 3D printing and with being able to take a section of an electronics design, and just isolate it on just a single $8 chip and say, well, this function, it's always going to have a heartbeat. So the heartbeat's going to be controlled by this little $3 widget. And it's going to sit over here because we know we're never going to have to touch this again. Now let's start looking at detecting chest tube insertion or whatever we were doing that, that week. It really let us kind of minimize how many things we were changing every single time we changed something. And I think that that's that's where the role of design really comes back in is it's like 3D printing, 3D scanning. It, it really is just another tool. You've, you've, you've got to have a really good mastery of what that tool can do and can't do, both in software and hardware to, to figure out how to use it. You had a question that has come up. <laughs> I, I know my answer. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I, I kind of wanted to go back a little bit, and maybe it's literally taking um, the title um, that Mark had given this panel, which is, is design lost, or will it be lost in the, in the process? And to think, um, we bounced back and forth in a little bit in your discussion between designers and just because you can do this, you're not a designer. And I'd like to kind of put that aside for a moment and talk about design, because one of the things that's interesting to me is yes, this is a tool, right? And it's a neat tool, and it's actually a tool that can do things we couldn't do before. You know, can't cast things inside of things, for example. Um, and but we've had really neat tools in the past. You know, we had when the somebody else mentioned a camera. So when the camera obscura was first understood, there was this: Do we need painters anymore? Can everybody be a great painter? Um, and then cameras, and then photography, and all the different errors of photography, and always like, is this the end of painting, or you know, we, and or painters, or f then with digital photographers, are they now no longer needed because everybody can be a photographer? And so what's interesting to me is at this point in time we have, and something people talked about earlier in the day, this sort of um, renewal or renaissance of appreciation of design, you know of people really caring about design and suddenly understanding good design and, and being delighted, wanting products that delight them and not just to work. And so we have that happening at the same time that we have this tool coming out that does make it easier in some ways to make things and could make everybody just with or without you know, making things. But those things can only be made as well as the tool that we're given, the version of the tool we're given, you know, the cup, person picking the cup, well, were there only six colors they could pick from, right? And so what I'm wondering is if you can kind of imagine for a moment some kind of arc in time with this particular group of developments, 3D scanners, 3D printers, as a tool and, and how they're gonna be used in all the ways you thought, what will that do for design? I mean, will we, in fact, will this end up being some pinnacle point when people really appreciated good design and we had so much delight in what we were being offered, or not? Uh, again, I, I, th I mean, I think you can look back and see a variety of different moments, you know, when Adobe came out with, you know, and now people are starting to play with their imagery and, again, YouTube. I mean, I think it'll probably follow a similar track where more people be making things and you know you'll get some moments that pop up where someone who a few years before wouldn't have had the um, 
uh, access to the to the ability to actually make a physical object now can in a much more quickly and easy uh, manner. Um, but along with those tools, which I think you're saying, and, and I'm playing a lot with these inexpensive laser scanners now, and my group and I talk a lot about how, you know, they're making scans of things to be products and sculptures, but they feel constantly like they have this army of other people that are controlling their hand through this tool. And that army are all the software engineers and hardware engineers that made these scanners who are, who, who have put in these kind of baked in parameters, if you will, um, that are the limitations that that tool can actually produce. So we talk a lot about how something so um, complex as this scanner allows you to do, on one hand, all these amazing things. You can create objects like this, but on the other hand, it's very, it has a lot of limitation. And we talk about sort of the pencil, and it's a simple thing to make, and it still has, it still inside of it has this huge potential of creativity in a lot of ways more than the scanner. Harder to use to create for most people what they want, the vision they have in their head, but still uh, through mastery, through learning design and spending time with it, it's going to reveal, we think, um, more than these scanners can. So, so it's, a, it's a question I'm not totally sure the answer to yet, but it feels like you're gonna get more people making objects. Some of them would be fantastic but I am personally nervous that the limitations of this tool are going to ultimately kind of narrow um, the scope and the vision of people's inherent sort of um, understanding of, of design, the sort of, you know, what, what sort of nature gives us to understand how form and proportion work and so forth. I, I, we worry about in this group is maybe getting eroded a little bit through some of this technology. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that Nathan brought up earlier was tools leading to tools leading to tools. And that I think is the battle that's being waged because there will be a point in time, but previous to things like 3D printing and 3D scanning, it was, there was part of the process that was taking a really, really long time and that was manufacturing and it was very expensive. And it led to all kinds of things. Uh, and then various pushes all over the place led that to change. Everything from the way they did waterfall management into agile, because focusing on iteration, and then these technologies that back up iteration, it led to fixing what was that problem at the time, which was manufacturing being the longest, most expensive part of the process for a lot of different things. That has now been somewhat fixed in terms of it's now a lot easier and more accessible, but it's brought up another problem where now the issue may be that it takes a long time to design these things. Like I keep going back to that car, but it took 18 months to design it. What are the tools that can make that design happen faster? If I go to, they talk about customizing that car to what I want. Well, I can customize my car now. I can choose what package it has. I can choose if it has leather seats. I can choose if it is an automatic or a stick or a stick shift. Um, what level of customization am I looking for and how long or how much investment do I have to have in that? So once these tools reach a maturity where they are, they are very easy to use themselves, which I think we're rapidly approaching with the current set of tools, there will be expansion into new materials and sizes and things like that, but that's mostly semantics. We have this other gap a little bit like I was talking about earlier where the actual design portion of, portion of the object that has to be addressed. And that needs to be addressed by people who understand the output that uh, is in the brain of, of the customers, but also understand the whole process on both ends of the spectrum to kind of fill that in. And so we will have these printers or machines of any kind manufacturing, we will have that problem mostly solved where it's a lot easier and it's changed. But we still have this kind of unexplored frontier that has come up that is the actual design of these objects. Because previously we didn't worry about that because that was less expensive and everything else than manufacturing. So let's fix manufacturing. Well, now it's flipped. 
And that I think is what's really interesting about what we're talking about all day today is that now the focus is kind of back on design. We no longer have to make all these compromises for scale and scope and all that stuff. We can go, okay, well, that, that part's easy. Let's focus now on what's the real hard part, which is the actual design. when you were speaking of that, um, I kind of jumped to photography. And I thought, okay, how many billion photographs are taken every day? Where do they go to live? Are they ever looked at again? So there's a little bit of this as sort of generating filaments of plastic, which are colorful and fun to play with, and making objects that end up under the bed in the back of the drawer. It, it's sort of a prol proliferation of objects, kind of like the... Um, uh, Victorian fascination with diatoms, you know, and collecting, you know, images of snowflakes. It's, sort of, it's what we're paying attention to right now, and what's the value in paying attention to that? Because your culture is what you pay attention to. So this may be a bump in the road, it may be the wave of the future, but it's kind of interesting to think about it in the way we think of pixels now as sort of disposable stuff, you know, where, whereas an image that was made you know, through the laborious process that Matthew Brady used and chemical process. It was a precious object. Silver was involved, in fact. Uh, and so moving from precious object to disposable stuff brings up the issue of sort of the, the ecosystem, the actual ecosystem within which this plastic circulates now on the planet and what's in that plastic. And I know Jackie Isaacs, if she were here, would be asking that question. Is like, is this just another form of smoke? from a smokestack called a 3D printer. You know, some noise around that. I, I shockingly also have an opinion on this. Um, I think that, that these new technologies, whether they're in your house or in a service bureau, bureau or whatever, um, are really gonna have to, to be a responsible designer 20 years from now. I think you are no longer designing objects. You're designing a system that you know, can define a range of objects. And you're also designing an interface with which people can discover where in that range is the appropriate object for them. Um, and I think that's gonna take, that's gonna take a real shift in thinking um, from the perspective of designers. And I think some of it might be able to be helped along with sort of computer science systemization type thinking. But I think there's, there's this new kind of unexplored, at least to me unexplored realm of thinking that needs to bring in a lot of this user data that we were talk that we've been talking about, a lot of um, you know psychology, a lot of biology, a lot of different things that probably no one's invented yet, to be able to to correctly design these ecosystems for people that who, so that um, users can then have the best object for them. Yeah, that's a that's a big question. I mean best object for them, <laughs> who am I to say, but at the same time, maybe I'm the one who says it, when it comes to my, when it comes to the thing that I've made. Um, yeah, I mean, to, to, to Nathan's point, I shudder for our landfills uh, with these plastic tchotchkes that are being printed constantly. It it's, reminds me of the paperless society that we had a little while ago. And now we're just cranking out these little plastic things, and we're cranking them out because they, they are magical for people because they're cheap enough. You can reproduce them. You can make them easily. But again, they end up just, like you say, falling under the bed or whatnot. And we really do need to start getting away from that. Um, there are materials that are um, fantastic that are 3D printed. Ceramic is something I absolutely love. It's actually relatively inexpensive. It is totally FDA food safe. You can print um, in very large pieces for relative inexpense, but for some reason, and I'm not exactly sure why, it hasn't really taken off as much as plastic, and I think it's potentially um, because we, as a culture, like this kind of pop stuff, and nobody thinks pop ceramic. They sort of think pop plastic, you know, comes in your Cracker Jack box or whatnot. It's this kind of, so as a designer, person, one of my personal mandates is try to shift away from these plastics. And then another side note, a kind of weird irony, there's been a lot of groups that have been trying to come up with these 
re plastic recyclers where you can put your bottle in and make a cufflink out of it or put your old toothbrush in and get a new toothbrush and why not? And I don't know why these just haven't come to the surface except that I know that a lot of these companies make a lot of money selling you plastic. So there's certainly some pushback there. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, as a culture, we need to start thinking about um, particularly metals and ceramics, I think. I believe it's still true, maybe remind, if I'm wrong, but that the only 3D printed material that actually is more environmentally friendly as a 3D printed part are, are some metals. And that's only if you look at the entire life of the part. So for example, if you pick up, if you print a bracket for an airplane, it takes more money and energy to produce that bracket, but the fuel savings you get by putting that on the airplane ultimately saves you money. But that's the only one still. Um, and that really shouldn't be the case because you can print highly efficient um, pieces that are extremely functional um, in a lot of different materials. So I think um, hopefully when the smoke blows away a little bit, we'll kind of get back to all right, let's be serious. What can we do with this stuff? Um, and I think that's when, you know, we'll really have our work cut out for us. Yeah, I think another question you brought up, which was um, what can we make what the customer wants is a, a great question because it, it goes across a lot of what all the other speakers have talked about today. And it also brings up another question of is what they want the actual best solution for them. <laughs> well, but the the you know the understanding the customer needs um, is a thread throughout all of design and, and understanding or understanding need in general. And what the customization just allows us to do is instead of going okay, what's the the uh, lowest common denominator we need to sell ten thousand of these. We can we can specialize that need a lot more, and um, so Ryan, for some of the stuff that you were doing with the the simulation stuff, how did you develop need for that? Like you know this this trying to build that in. How was how was customer need developed for a system that complex? I mean, I think that 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 was the role of a designer on the team was. We were already, we were two months into making a more advanced version of the simulator we had delivered to the special forces beforehand. And the army said, great, we love it. Like, what could you guys do if we gave you more money? Which was like every research lab's dream, right? So we took us, it took us a week to come up with that, which was we'll just do the same thing, only better, right? <laughs> but that that completely did not involve any of the design process, which was, hey, let's spend a lot of time in Texas. Let's go through the training that they go through. Let's like, actually shake the tree a bit and realize that we train 14,000 medics a year with 400 instructors. It's not a technology issue. It was, it was a training issue. There was a shortage of instructors. So while we may have built a six foot tall, bleeding, screaming, dying, 18 year old soldier, what it really did was serve as a platform to deliver the education that a combat medic instructor was going to be giving to those 18 year old combat medics. That's what its job was. It, it started off as being, can we make the world's most realistic dying person? But that's not what they needed. We, we kind of slipped the the training object into that process. And then when they saw it and they saw what it actually did, they, they, they loved it. I mean, it's, it, was, um, it was a process. It was a design process. It was something we, we knew we were going into. It was something that everybody fought until they saw the end result. And the number of times everyone wanted to kill me when I said, no, it's gotta have one big button to turn the thing on and shut it off and everything else should be automated. Um, that, that was a seven year fight until we were done and you handed it off and every single person grabbed it and they turned around like, this is easy. Like this is advanced and then dragged it through the mud and everybody 
thought that it was this very simple, boring thing that they had seen before until they started using it. And then they started seeing how much data it was collecting and what it was actually providing. And it was the first time that an 18 year old was alone in the dark with somebody who was dying. Like that simple, elegant moment that was shared by one person where they're like, oh my God, there's no instructor over my shoulder that I can't, because that's what they were doing. They were looking at each other going, what do I do? And that, that was the problem we were really solving was they could do that. And so all, all we had to do is get rid of that, make a device that was autonomous and realistic enough that you could actually be scared at night. And that's what they did. And we just had to figure out how to make that happen. <laughs> but there, was, there were seven people. So <laughs> that's where the rapid prototyping came in. It's like we, we couldn't have a lot of people doing manufacturing. We couldn't have anybody sitting on the mill cranking parts out. It had to be something we could push print and come in in the morning and, and it, it would be done. Yeah, and that, that um, is another great example of what has been a theme throughout all day today, which is that good design can feel dumb. It can feel obvious. It can feel essential because that's kind of the point. And so one of the other things that a lot of these technologies allow us to do is to attempt to get to good design easier. To get to to get to design that is um, that fits our needs faster, and uh, that I think is really where their power lies. Um, they have right now they have very specific uses, and several of the people who I've spoken today have come up with excellent case studies of how these things have been used correctly, and it's that's really what they're there for, and they have proven them proven these technologies to be excellent. I think as these technologies trickle out, it'll be really interesting to see the kind of side effects as they start to mutate and change out there as we're already seeing and to see how that impacts um, good design and or what we think about for design. Can I ask a question about the relationship or what I'm experiencing or what I've experienced in my world is the difference between making and prototyping. So, you know, making is something that is a, sort of technical requirement at a certain point we have to be able to make something and and prototyping is is it's an intellectual pursuit it's like I, I have there's a, a question invested in my construction of a prototype and I'm what I'm hearing from the panel is some examples of where you build a prototype of that screaming uh, soldier um, you know that's a prototype that's meant to simulate something and I, I think you probably went through a prototyping exercise to get there versus making thing which is the execution of something because I just got to get it built. Um, and so what is the relationship between, where I think we use these terms interchangeably a lot of times, so can you speak to that? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I make apparent to a lot of my design students in both engineering and in art and design, because I have this fun ability to teach both, um, is that when you're prototyping, there is a hypothesis, you are, creating something that will be tested. And that's where um, some of the issues with my issues with 3D printing can pop up is because it can allow iteration to happen so quickly that you haven't digested the data you've received from the prototype. And so you can uh, miss the forest for the trees. You can, you can miss the context because you have to, in order to go through the design process, you have to collect the feedback and come back around in order to have a successful iteration. You can't brute force it and just try every permutation. That's not, that, that doesn't end up working. And so I think that when prototyping, the thought at the very beginning is to have something we're going to use to test. It's going, we're going to learn from this. And that's where the, the fail quickly thing comes in that, that we've been talking about all day. I look at it much more as, as learning because you know, I've learned so much more from stuff that's broken than stuff that hasn't. And many times the stuff that hasn't broken, I'm just sitting there with cold sweats waiting for it to break when it's in a place that it shouldn't be and it may break. So I prefer way more often to have things break early on and have me fundamentally change designs than have it go, oh, well, this is fine. It was, you know, floated through all of our testing. It works perfectly because I know that there's something in there that wasn't perfect. So I think that prototyping uh, as part of the, the whole overall process is to try to get enlightened iterations out of the design of something, to try and understand more about your audience, more about the touch, the feel, that, that's what 
they were talking about with the medical devices, that is the role of prototyping. The role of making can be more at the end point, can be we've, we've solved this and now this is the best solution for this creation is with this technology. The term that I much more prefer for what is classically thought of as making is tinkering because there's kind of this separate category between those two, which would allow you to just not formalize the process, not try to learn anything specific on a hypothesis, a hypothesis but more to explore, just do exploration through a prototype. And I consider that more in like the, the tinkering realm instead of one of the other two. Um. I'm sitting here thinking about those two words, and I feel like maybe they're used interchangeably, at least from the, the design and arts community that I know, because it feels to me like they, they nest inside of each other. You're prototyping the object, then you make it, but that prototyping to, to, to final sort of made object is part of the prototyping of you and your design sense. It's, it's who, it's like you're prototyping yourself as you're making, as you're prototyping to make, and it becomes this kind of, this cycle. And so I think about my studio practice as, it's like I never, and nothing is ever made. It's always prototyped because it's this constant, you know, if something is made, it's out the door and it's on to the next thing. And, um, I think as a designer, that's, that's an important way to think about what it is that you're doing. It's this constant refinement of yourself that you're constantly prototyping the vision and the language that you have through the experiences that you have in the world. And that might be an addendum to some of the design, the, the collection and the you know, categories, some of the things that you spoke about. I think is is just being a reporter of your experiences back through your design and through the art that you make is something that really starts to build you as a designer. And I think everybody can do this, absolutely. Um, the people who I know are very good designers are very just extremely sensitive to the things that they need to collect in everyday life to then report back on. And I think that's, what makes them a good designer. Um, and that's what makes them successful in prototyping their, their own sort of sense of themselves and the things that they make. In, in my world, those words have very specific meanings. Um, prototype is pre-manufacturing. That's something you hand off. You can't justify anymore. It's got to do its thing. It is as finished an object as you will create before manufacturing and duplicating it, everything else are proofs of concept, right? So it's, I have an idea, I want to explore it, or I am tinkering, that's something we use a lot, sketching, right? Just working out an idea in plywood and foam and duct tape, rapid prototyping, who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. You're exploring. Once you get organized about what you're trying to do, then the proof of concept comes in. I'm trying to isolate this one thing I'm learning about or these 10 things I learned about into one new thing. Um, but a prototype to me is something that is done. You hand it off and you see if it does what you intended it to do. And I think that's the, that's the unfortunate role of the designer is you really don't get the ultimate say in things, right? Like that's, that's art and where you don't really have to worry about what other people think. It's, it's a very personal expression design you are always second. You're always, it, who, unless you're some super fancy designer hired to like come up with a pattern or, you know, but if you don't do a pattern, you're like, I did a movie instead. You're probably not gonna get a second job. But um, as a designer, you are always second. You have to communicate your intentions through the object or through the, whether it's an application, piece of hardware, process. It's gotta do its thing because you are not the end user. You, you are not, you can't control it all the time. And so that to me, that, that in, the, in our world, that's always been a prototype is something where you test that. That's you put it behind the closed doors and see if it does, does what you want. I think we have about time for one more question. If not, I'll just wrap us up. 
just a comment on what you just said about uh, well, what you've said about these terms. Uh, I think there's also another way to express this other than the those things uh, or the activity of those things, but to set them in different contexts and the differences between, for example, a lab and a workshop and a studio and a clinic, and even in a kind of a medical sense, a clinic is where you begin to test with the end user. A workshop is where you reduce to practice, common practice, certain tools th that, are, that function as tools <laughs> for you. Uh, the lab is where the, you are designing experiments, maybe more toward your tinkering in that area. But just in the studio, again, is a sort of reduced to practice uh, of a particular discipline, a particular set of tools, certain methods and techniques come into play, which might be shared amongst you. But they seem like different, not, not phases or stages, but different kinds of sort of frames of mind. It can still be the same room, but you're really operating in a different, uh, there are different relationships to the what you're working on, the idea, and who you're doing it for, it seems to me. Yeah, context is huge in, in the entire process. It, it sets expectations when you walk in every single one of those doors. Um, and understanding that is a huge part of being a good designer, right? Of knowing that my terrible looking concoction of plywood and bits and pieces and wires and reservoirs is actually trying to communicate in an interesting idea, putting that in the right context so that you're not making it, ta-da, this is done, um, is really, it, it's part of the design process. That, that is why you should have a designer involved. Because a lot of times, we worked with a lot of engineers and we could never get anything moved forward or spark any interest because it would take three guys with PhDs to turn the machine on, one to get the thing to boot up, another one to connect it, figure out why it wasn't working right away. And the end user was just like, really, this is advanced? <laughs> so it was, you know, understanding when to stop working and start polishing just a little bit. So that does what it's supposed to do to communicate the idea is just as important as whatever novel algorithm you're actually trying to show. Yeah, so to um, kind of bring us back around, I think that the important parts, the important things to understand about these technologies that are coming out that will continue to get more and more pervasive, that will continue to be a larger part of our lives and also the, the processes that we use to do what we do is to understand that they need to have a role. They can't be a Band-Aid that gets attached to everything that's not, even though they may appear to be very useful, Right now, many of these technologies have a narrow band where that's where you can get the most impact out of them. And under, just like any other tool that you have, understanding the role of that tool and uh, how it's best used is one of the most important things. Um, another large piece to think about is where in the process these technologies are most useful. Is it in the iteration process? You know, if it's rapid prototyping of just, you know, we're going to do paper and whatever, then that's fine. But understanding how you can communicate your ideas. If a, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then an actual prototype of the thing is worth a whole lot more. And so that's where a lot of this comes from. The idea that we don't have to picture it in our mind. We don't have to picture it in a picture. We can have it. And so understanding where these technologies fit inside your process is how you can use them um, to the, the strongest possible point. And then also understanding how your customers view them. How, how are they going to look at these technologies? How do they interact with them? What's their, uh, how do they perceive their use? And then that will allow you to best adapt their advantages and try to um, minimize the disadvantages of these technologies and use them to their full potential. Because they are here to stay, they are excellent, Everybody should go out and use them, as you've heard many people talking about today. They, um, they really can help you do things in new ways and uh, allude to an agility that is, has been building up for a long time across all manners of uh, what we do. So uh, thank you.